This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, episode 142. Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to episode 142 of the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about how to sell the value of a building automation system. Now, you've probably heard these questions in the past. Why should I upgrade my BAS? Aren't all BAS the same? So on and so on. You know, so and so can give me the same system for 5% less, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is, most of these questions are stuff you've probably heard time and time again. And here's the truth you've been sold a lie. You've been told that if you're being asked these questions, that you're not selling the value of a BAS. And that's pretty much utter bull crap. The reality is, is, is that most BAS devices are the same. Now, I, I know this is kind of hard to accept because it goes against pretty much everything that most sales folks are taught. You know, you're taught, well, I'm going to go sell the value and the, the benefits, not the features though. No, no, never the features, the benefits of our BAS, which is just another way of saying I'm going to sell the features. I mean, it's when you're trying to sell a component and all of the freaking components are exactly the same, then you're selling features. I, let's just deal with that right now. If you're trying to go and say my device is different because of this, it provides benefit. No, 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 no. Your benefits are in your operational processes. Your benefits are in your people who are more highly trained by and decades of experience than your local competitors. Your benefits are in your processes of how you design and estimate. Your benefits are in post-contract service. They are not in the features of your building automation system. Maybe a decade ago this was true. But nowadays it's not. So then really, what is the value of a building automation system? You know, how do you differentiate yourself? Well, this isn't a very easy question to answer. It really depends on your position. And something that I want you to hear in this podcast is that you must sell from a position of power. Now, some of you may not think of yourselves as salespeople. You're up. Uh, I would say a good half of our listening audience is pretty much technicians, engineers, but all of you are selling. Whether you're selling a upgrade that way or a retrofit or some sort of change order, that way you have work and you're not sitting at home during the winter or during the spring or fall when there's no work, you need to be able to sell. If you're an engineer, you especially need to be able to sell, especially since margins are super, super tight. That's something that's interesting to me. Just a side note here. A lot of folks don't realize this because not a lot of folks have done engineering. And when I'm talking about engineering, I'm talking about specifying things like that. The margins on specifying engineers is super, super tight. We think that our margins are super tight as controls professionals, but as engineers, they are incredibly tight. So when you sit there and you're like, man, it looks like the engineer just rubber stamped this, just copied this from another job. Well, when you're dealing with super tight margins, that's the reality of what comes. I mean, that's the same. We always complain about value engineering. Well, when you value engineer, that's what you get. When you put super tight cost pressure, folks either find a way to be really unique or they just copy previous stuff. I mean, that's the reality of things. All right. So back, back to the topic here. So you see this topic, most sales trainers, they avoid this topic. And it's quite honestly, because most sales trainers, they either haven't been our, in our industry or they've been in our industry, but you know, two decades ago when the strategies they're teaching you worked. And that's the funny thing about sales training, entrepreneurship, etc. something I've learned as a business owner is when you look at what other companies did or are doing, 
oftentimes they're using strategies that were successful for them. So for example, if you're looking at a salesperson who has been in the industry for 40 years, 30 years, whatever, some some long period of time, and you're trying to copy that person's strategies, that will not work for you in this day and age. The problem is, is that that person has built up a reputation within the industry, within their local market to where they can go and influence sales. But going and influencing the buyer and influencing the spec, while that can work, it's a much harder thing to do nowadays than it was when this 30-year sales veteran was doing it 30 years ago and not everyone was thinking of doing that strategy. Are you following what I'm saying here? Um, I see this in all forms of business. I see this in marketing. I see this in delivery models for products and for services. If you're following what everyone else is doing, most of the time that stuff will not work and everyone's doing it because that's what got them success 20 years ago, but the market has shifted. You see, Here's the deal. With a simple Google, I can go and find out most of the things that you would go and provide benefit for. So, for example, if you were going to help me write my spec, I could go and Google, you know, building automation specifications, file type, colon, PDF. Hey, and that's a free tip for you. That is something that will save you hundreds of dollars. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, but in all seriousness, you can simply Google building automation spec file type colon PDF and booyah, there are a ton of freaking specs that you can just copy right there. So the value of providing that information is not very valuable. Now, interpreting what that information means, interpreting how to go and implement something. That is where you can provide value. Now, here's the deal. You have to be selling from your position of power. I already said that, right? So as it stands right now, the BAS industry can be broken into three buckets, kind of three categories that you can place yourself in. And that is an OEM, a systems integrator, and a mechanical who is now carrying a controls line. So in this episode, we're gonna explore the three keys to selling the value of controls. Now to do that, I'm gonna assume you're selling through a construction process, uh, key number, uh, meaning that you're most likely plan and spec work, maybe design, bid, build, or design, build. Um, but what we cover will work for retrofit or any owner direct sales. You just have to make some minor tweaks to it. So first off, key number one, you need to identify your position. I know this seems like really obvious, but you need to figure out what you are and who you sell to because that is largely going to depend or determine how you go and position yourself. I'm like moving my hands around, whacking my mic. I, I get really excited when I talk about this stuff. All right. So if you're an OEM, your value prop is going to be completely different than that of, you know, a systems integrator that services one office. So here are some general value positions and weaknesses based on those positions. So an OEM, they tend to have more standardized processes. They usually have some more price flexibility because corporate can absorb prices. They can go and get permission to dip really low, sometimes into the negative margins if they perceive that they can go and essentially buy a job and then make it up on the service side or a vendor lock the owner. So you can see that those are some strategies right there. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just the reality. Now, the system is usually inaccessible to other contractors, and that's not from an integration perspective, more so just from a tools perspective. Most of the time, you can't purchase the tools. The contractors can't. The, the owners can usually get access, but contractors can't. Now, system integrator, they can sometimes be lower priced because they've got less overhead. 
They tend to provide a openly procured system, which we've done episodes on the difference between openly procured, we've open integration, open tool set, et cetera. But they tend to provide a openly procured system, meaning that anyone can go buy it from the local distributor. But the thing is, is a lot of system integrators can be dependent on a single person. They may even have 10, 20, 30 people, but they have one advanced Niagara person or they have one advanced IT person. And so this isn't every system integrator. These are generalizations. So I want to be clear. Some of you are getting butt hurt because you're hearing this and you're like, oh, but I've got 500 people. Well, yeah, you got five. So then it's not freaking you. So don't get butt hurt about it. But some system integrators are dependent on a single person. Some aren't. I mean, these are just that kind of 80-20 rule. And you've got mechanical contractors. They can package controls with mechanical systems, do a turnkey install, and they have less margin pass through. Those are some pretty powerful positions to be in. So you can already, if you're listening to this, um, and you'll see this a little bit later, or you'll hear this a little bit later. We're on a podcast. How are you going to see anything? You could, can you tell that I'm a visual person? I, I use visual terms all the time. Anyways, so as I was saying, you can already hear some of the ways that we can use our positions, right? The OEM is going to have standardized processes. Typically, they're going to have more of a global reach, typically, <clears throat> So how would we use that in our positioning? Well, we would use those processes in our positioning. System integrators can be a lower price. They can also do things with multiple different product lines that could be used in our positioning. Mechanical contractors have packaged controls with mechanical systems and less margin pass through. Those can be very valuable cost positions. Now, the mechanical contractor also can be inexperienced in controls. So that's something to be aware of. A lot of mechanical contractors will just slap a controls line on because they have service customers mechanically who are saying, hey, we've got mechanical service customers. They've got a control system. They've asked us to look at the controls. So we're going to go and find a guy or gal and have them do our controls. So like I said, generalizations, but not necessarily untrue, not necessarily true. It just depends on how you kind of fall into one of those three positions. So now step two or key number two, you need to identify your value proposition. So you have to ask yourself, right? Do you have domain expertise? Do you have a stronger geographical presence? Can you provide value added services? Can you absorb cost pressures to capture a project? You know, what are these things? And as a sales professional or tech or an engineer, you may be thinking to yourself, Man, I, this isn't my job to figure all this stuff out. No, you're absolutely right. The management should be figuring this out and driving a strategy. However, they often don't. And because they don't, you or maybe it doesn't get communicated to you, you should be aware of this. Now, how would you build a value proposition? So let's say you do healthcare and let's say you're a system integrator. Let's just pick those two, right? So healthcare, what are the most important aspects of healthcare? Well, it, there's a difference, right? If it's a medical office building or if it's a hospital, uh, you got to figure out what it is. Then you got to ask yourself, okay, what am I providing? Am I going and saying, hey, look, we can put a dedicated person on your hospital. You will never be down because we will stock parts and we'll have someone there all the time. So that's one way. We can also go and say, man, we really have domain expertise. We really understand how hospitals work and we understand how to review your designs and make sure that you are designing your hospital as efficiently as possible. We've analyzed other hospitals. We've worked with a lot of hospitals. We know hospitals. We are going to go and make sure your specification and your standard for your hospital makes it as efficient as possible, always up, always working. You've got super tight control in your ORs. Your MRI, ma MRI machines are never down because of the environment, and you're going to be making money. 
And that is one way to position yourself. Now let's shift, right? So you've got K through 12 and let's say you're an OEM. Okay, well, I'm an OEM and I've got K through 12. Well, we can be really low cost and we can go and create a bundled kit for every one of your schools. So that way, when you build a school, you know exactly what you're going to get. It's always predictable. The cost is predictable and we're going to go and provide that value proposition to you. It's tailored to your vertical market and it's tailored to using your strength positions. So you can see the OEM can work with corporate to actually package up a kit for K through 12. I would argue that all three of those positions, the mechanical contractor, the system integrator, and the OEM can do that. However, <clears throat> It is a little bit easier for OEMs to tend to do that because they can apply cost pressure to their suppliers and build a bundled kit that may would actually be, in most cases, a lower price than what anyone else would be able to get. So you can kind of see, now you may once again be thinking to yourself, all right, I'm, in, I'm a salesperson. How am I going to build a kit for K through 12. That is not realistic, Phil. I can't go and I don't have time with my sales goals or as a technician, I don't have time with all my service work to go build a kit. But yes, actually you do, but not probably how you're thinking about it. So to build a kit for a K through 12 school is actually quite simple. You just go literally build a kit of parts for a K through 12 school based on either rooftops or a central plant air handler strategy and VAVs, obviously. Then once you've done that, that kit can get used K through 12 school, K through 12 school. And then you have, especially if you're an OEM, you have other folks apply the cost pressure. That's not your job. Your job is just to come up with a kit and, mar and the messaging to deliver to your customers. And then you just sell that value proposition. So step or key number three, I keep saying steps for some reason. I just like the word step more than key. Uh, so key number three is you need to identify your attack vector. How are you going to approach this, right? How are you going to go and approach your strategy? Now we've already done a little bit of this. And so the first way you could do that is cost strategies. I just gave you some ways in which you can do some cost strategies. The second way you could do are scope strategies. The third way is spec influence. Now I know earlier you heard me rail against spec influence, but spec influence does work. It's just not as simple as going, hey, here's my guide deck, use this. And it's like this blatant spec that's flat spec, blah, blah, blah product and da, 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 da. Uh, spec influence is not going and providing your guide spec. I mean, there are some folks who will take your guide spec and run with it, but really spec influence is about understanding the outcome that the customer wants from their building and then finding an innovative way to actually communicate and influence that outcome through the specification. And that means you understand the technologies that are going into the specification. You can look at that specification and work with the engineer to provide suggestions. When challenges come up, you're there to answer them so that engineer isn't sitting there holding the bag being like, oh my goodness, I'm trying to figure out why you said I should be using this type of sensor instead of that type of sensor and you're off you know, somewhere else and they're trying to explain that to the owner getting yelled at. That is more of your value from that perspective. Cost strategies are everything from absorbing margin so that you can make it up on the back end, which that just befuddles me as an industry why we do. I, I I don't know. I, I've had many conversations with folks about just how ridiculous it is that we will go and be at anywhere from eight to 12% margin to win a job, sometimes even way less than that, but then go charge 30, 40% on the back end to make up the job. Everyone knows we do it. We all talk about it. We all joke about it. But yet, I mean, you can't seem to break that 
I mean, there are ways you can break that, you know, and that's actually a cost strategy you can use as a selling professional is is you can go in and say, hey, you know what? We are going to forecast costs for the next five years. Here's our cost of labor. Here's our cost of materials. Here's our cost of common tasks. And then you can use that actually as a competitive strategy. I've seen that used quite a bit lately where folks will do total cost for five years. They'll do the install and then they will do five years of projected maintenance costs with guaranteed labor costs and guaranteed material costs. And then they have everyone else compete against that. And that is a way if you are unable to lower your install cost, you can actually go and be competitive on the service cost. Now, scope strategies, these are all over. I mean, there's so many scope strategies that you could do, you know, bundling of equipment if you're a mechanical, going and shifting to using smart equipment, the back net card, lieu of controllers, going and actually not controlling specific things that aren't going to influence the key outcomes of your building performance. So, for example, doing complex lighting control strategy, while nice, um, outside of turning on and off specific zones, there's not much of a economic impact. Now, some folks will argue with me, but the reality is you're going to get much more bang for your buck going with different lighting fixtures and different lighting sources than you are with a control strategy for a lighting system. So with all this being said, let's revisit our three keys, right? So key one is you need to identify your position. You need to know what you are, who you are, and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Key number two is you need to identify your value proposition. You know, what are you exactly can you provide and what is it that makes you unique? And then how are you going to deliver? So key number three is your attack vector. How are you going to deliver your value proposition? Are you going to do it through cost? Are you going to do it through scope? Are you going to do it through spec influence? You see, the value that comes with a BAS is much less from the BAS itself. And I hope I've broken you of that belief that you think the actual part itself provides the value, which is completely false. It just maybe 10 20 years ago, that was true. But nowadays, it's not true. The value of a BAS comes from the experience and capabilities of those who execute and design the projects that get implemented. That experience is going to enable you to be low if that's your strategy, be unique if that's your strategy, cover the account, influence the sale if that is your strategy. You know, each technique has pros and cons. And they all work, but it's up to you to understand your business and apply the strategy that works for you. Now, recently we rolled out our BAS scoping and estimating beta, and we're starting to produce the lessons for that. And that'll be finished right around late December. And if you are in any way, shape or form involved in creating a scope and or estimate for a building automation job, you're really going to want to enroll in that course when it becomes available. For the rest of you, we have a lot of great courses that cover the key fundamentals of building automation systems, especially for a selling professional. Our building automation systems A to Z and our building automation fundamentals courses provide the key information you need to have in order to be credible in dealing with engineers, consultants, and owners. Really encourage you to check out buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 142. Once again, that's buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 142 to find out some more information about that. Thanks a ton for listening, and I can't wait to talk to you again next week when we will be dealing with the topic of working with smart equipment. We'll be talking through what is smart equipment, how do we work through it, what concerns do we need to have when we are working with smart equipment, both from a sales perspective as well as a technical perspective, and we'll just be diving through this because... I'm seeing a shift in the industry right now, which is that 
we really went, we started off kind of with application specific controllers, meaning controllers that you really couldn't program. We shifted to free programmable controllers. And now with the skill set gap that we're experiencing, we're shifting back towards smart equipment, which is more of an application specific controller. Yet I see time and time again, both jobs and implementations of those jobs. So the design and the implementation of a project are struggling because they're not doing a couple key things related to smart equipment. And we'll be covering that in next week's episode. Thanks a ton for being here. And I'll talk to you all again next week. Take care.